Jesus is King. This is Timothy Flanders at the Meaning of Catholic. This talk is called Joseph Ratzinger and the Fourth Greco-Roman Renewal. It is a development of the ideas that I put in my book, City of God versus City of Man. And it is an attempt to see the great value of Joseph Ratzinger in this particular moment in history, in our modernity, and to look towards the future. When we look through the whole history of the church, we can see and we can note these four different Greco-Roman renewals. And this talk is an exploration of that to give context in the history of the church to the life and legacy of Joseph Ratzinger. So if you want the full talk, you need to become a guild member, patreon.com slash meaningofcatholic, meaningofcatholic.com slash register. Tonight's talk is entitled Joseph Ratzinger and the Fourth Greco-Roman Renewal. So before we begin, let's greet Our Lady. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. In the year 29 BC, the Roman poet Virgil wrote an epic poem known today as the Aeneid. It was designed as propaganda for the Lord and Son of God that was at that time known to all, namely Caesar Octavian Augustus. But this propaganda took for granted that the Roman Son of God was in fact standing upon a long-standing tradition known as the Greco-Roman civilization. It was at this time a mutually beneficial cultural exchange between Athens and Rome. In book six of his epic poem, Virgil explains this. It was not for the Romans to handle philosophy and art. This was the job, says Virgil, of the Greeks. Your mission, Roman, is to rule the world, he writes. These will be your arts, to establish peace, to spare the humbled, and to conquer the proud. In other words, the Greeks would bring their love of wisdom, known as philosophia, philosophy in Greek, and the Romans would bring their love of order, and this would be Greco-Roman civilization. A Russian Catholic historian, Mikhail Emanuelovich Poznov, makes this observation, quote, The Greeks are not gifted by nature with the ability to govern and rule. During the golden age of Greece, they could not form a single solid political entity from their numerous republics. Inclined to intellectualism and speculation, the, Greeks, the Greek is naturally inclined to concentrate all his attention on the development of ideas and to neglect practical concerns. End quote. This accords with St. Luke's observation in Acts 17.21, quote, All the Athenians employed themselves in nothing else but either in telling or in hearing some new thing. This Greek desire for some new thing spurred their philosophy. We'll return to this, um, this newness in a moment. Continuing with Poznov, this Slavic historian says this about the Romans, quote, if the Greek has a philosophical genius, then the Roman has a juridical genius. Romans were not advanced in intellectual speculation. They much more preferred its practical application. Romans have a very strong administrative and organizing talent. Thanks to this talent, they introduced order and created a system for their empire." End quote. Thus, the Greco-Roman civilization took the best of both worlds and married the Greek speculative philosophy to the Roman practical administration. The Greek desire for some new thing was balanced by a Roman desire for stability or changelessness. Without the Roman mind, the Greeks would endlessly debate atop an Athenian hilltop. Without the Greek mind, the Romans would conquer the world with the false idea that might makes right. Socrates, a Greek, first refuted that bad philosophy. 
And the Romans were the ones to unite the Greek city-states into a cohesive system of administration, which the Romans later termed dioceses. That's a Roman pagan term. It was over all these dioceses that the Greco-Roman Lord and Son of God ruled. This was acknowledged by all educated Romans and Greeks who cared to keep their heads. But at that very moment, in the fringes of the empire, in a town called Bethlehem, angel armies were appearing and announcing a rival Lord and a rival Son of God. In the year 752, from the founding of the city of Rome, in the 42nd year of the empire of Octavian Augustus, when the whole world was in peace, in the sixth age of the world, Jesus Christ, eternal God and son of the eternal father, is born in Bethlehem of Judah, having become man of the Virgin Mary. If you've attended Christmas midnight mass, maybe you've heard this announcement from the Roman murderology. It was through the first Greco-Roman renewal that the church came to understand that this was not merely the historical observation of the martyrology, but it was an act of divine providence. Indeed, God himself had prepared a throne for himself by means of this Greco-Roman civilization. Eventually, St. Leo the Great would write that, quote, Divine providence prepared the Roman Empire so that the effect of divine grace might be distributed throughout all the world, end quote. The blessed apostle writes in Hebrews 1.6 about how God, quote, brought his firstborn into the ecumene, end quote. Ecumene is a, word, a Greek word which means the Greek world or the Roman world or the whole world. This is the word that gives its name to ecumenical councils, ecumeny. E. Michael Jones comments, and quote, Christ bade honor to the logos of history by waiting until the logos of metaphysics was in place, because without that quintessentially Greek vocabulary, no one could understand, much less explain who he was, end quote. This is conspicuous above all in John 1.1 which states, en archi in hologos. In the beginning was the logos, a Greek term with a vast philosophical pedigree developed for centuries at that point by the pre-Christian Greeks. This was the fruit of the Greek desire for some new thing. Yet a a few verses down, we catch the Roman love of order. Through him, the Logos, all things were made. In the Roman language, with which you are familiar from the last gospel, in principio erat verbum, omnia per ipsum facta sunt. This is thus in the first three verses of John's gospel, we have the Greco-Roman civilization united by the Logos incarnate. The Logos is the truth, according to the Greeks, And it is the order of the whole universe by which the Romans seek to rule. And then St. John announces to the world some new thing from God himself. That this logos, caro factum est, et habitavit in nobis. We also see this linguistically because the Greek language is particularly suited for subtlety and philosophical speculation. The, The term logos has no Latin equivalent. They use verbum, but verbum actually limits what's, what's being said there because logos is so deep. It has so much rich meaning philosophically because of the Greek tongue. <clears throat> the natural greatness of the Greco-Roman world was supernaturally elevated by God, bringing his son into the ecumeny at that moment. E. Michael Jones again, quote, Christianity became a mixture of Hebrew, Greek, and Roman culture, bringing to fulfillment the instruction which Pilate wrote for the cross in these three languages as the unwitting herald of the universality of the church, end quote. At this point, let's bring in Joseph Ratzinger. When speaking as Pope Benedict in his famous Regensburg address, quoting an Eastern Roman emperor, he discusses it this way, quote, 
We can see the profound harmony between what is Greek and the biblical understanding of faith in God. John began the prologue of his gospel with the words, In the beginning was the Logos. This is the very word used by the Roman emperor. He's quoting from this later text of a, a Greek Roman empire who says, God acts soon logo with logos. Logos means both reason and word, a reason which is creative and capable of self-communication precisely as reason. And it has this depth in the Greek language, but not as much in the Latin tongue. The encounter, continuing with Benedict's quote here, the encounter between the biblical message and Greek thought did not happen by chance. Acts 16 shows us the intrinsic necessity of a rapprochement between biblical faith and Greek inquiry. In point of fact, this rapprochement had been going on for some time. Christ, end quote, Christ came to vivify what divine providence had already been stirring up. With Greco-Roman civilization in place, Christ gave the deposit of faith to the apostles, empowering them with the Holy Spirit and they, going forth, preached everywhere, the Lord working with all and confirming the word with signs that followed. Mark 16, 20. The Acts of the Apostles tells the story of Peter and Paul and the apostles becoming the witnesses in Judea and Samaria and the end of the world. St. Paul travels the Roman highways. He preaches to the Greeks in Athens. And then he exercises his right as a Roman citizen in order to preach in Rome. The faith was preached in Aramaic, written in Greek, translated into the Roman tongue, Latin, then every other language besides. The local bishop integrated into the Roman system of dioceses. But immediately, tensions arose. This is where we get into our first Greco-Roman renewal. Don't worry, we're going to get to Joseph Ratzker. It just takes a, takes a minute here. The first Greco-Roman renewal had just begun. It would establish the relationship between Greco-Roman civilization and the Hebrew revelation. It was already controversial to integrate Gentiles in the church in the first place. After this was overcome, the question became, to what degree could Gentile culture be accepted by Christendom? Here we will meet the two protagonists in every Greco-Roman renewal, the strict party and the moderate party. For some took a very strict, strict stance to this question, erring on the side of rejecting most of this pre-Christian culture. This was the Roman instinct of Christendom, the Roman instinct for stability and resistance to change. This is the strict party, the strict Roman instinct. This view was summarized by Tertullian when he said, quote, what has Athens to do with Jerusalem? End quote. The strict party seeks to preserve what was handed down without change. But this could go too far. Indeed, Tertullian's embrace of heretical Montanism seems to have been a reaction against some new thing. The more moderate school of thought, this is our other protagonist, is best described by the Alexandrian catechetical school which chose to adopt a great deal of this Greek philosophy. This is the Greek instinct of Christendom, which desires some new thing, but not in order to change the depositum fidei, but rather to preserve it and to know truth himself. But the moderate party could go too far, as in the case of Origen. Yet through other fathers like Clement of Alexandria, the moderate school and others like them utilized and adopted a great deal of the pre-Christian culture in the service to the gospel. So we have these two parties, moderate and strict, Greco and Roman. The strict want to stay the same, the moderate want to change, but both want to contend for the faith once delivered to the saints. They both want to preserve the depositum fidei, but they want to do it in different ways vis-a-vis -vis Greek philosophy. They both have the same goal. They are on the same side. But if they don't work together, they could go too far in either direction. And it's if and only if they work together that we can have a renewal. And this first renewal is what establishes this initial relationship. So the heretics would sometimes go too far on the strict side and sometimes go too far on the moderate side for change. 
However, none of these anti-Nicene heresies seriously challenged the whole ecumeny, so the tensions between the moderate and the strict remain unsettled until a great heresy arose to spur on the first Greco-Roman renewal. Again, as E. Michael Jones comments, quote, God allows error to spread in order to bring about a greater truth, end quote. Arianism created a problem which necessitated the first Greco-Roman renewal. First, it was something of a universal phenomenon. As St. Jerome said after the Arian Council of Rimini, quote, the church awoke to find herself Arian, end quote. They estimate that most of the bishops didn't even believe that Jesus was the Son of God. The Arianism presented something of a philosophical problem because the Arians were able to use proof texts from Proverbs which seemed to prove their doctrine that Jesus was merely an exalted creature. The Alexandrian moderate school proposed a solution. Let us use Greek philosophy in order to communicate the truth of Jesus' divinity. They championed the term homoousios by using the Greek philosophical tradition, not of logos, but of the term ousios, meaning the nature of a thing. This was the school of St. Athanasius. But notice what is happening here. This is the Greek moderate school of thought, and they want to introduce some new thing, a new use of Greco-Roman civilization, in order to guard the depositum fidei. This was controversial. We we don't realize that because we say the Nicene Creed every Sunday, or we hear hear, uh, consubstantial and patri. It was extremely controversial to utilize this Greek philosophical term. Uh, part of it was because usia was usually used philosophically to mean something that was only in the natural order and could not be in the supernatural order. So it was an innovation. <clears throat> not only did all the various Aryan sects reject this with their own ecumenical councils, quote unquote, and support of their own emperors and armies, but another group rejected this innovation. And that was the Orthodox Strict Party. The Orthodox Strict Party, known to history as the Orthodox Semini Arians. They opposed the introduction of this Greek term because they argued it was ambiguous. Sound familiar? At first, St. Basil the Great was among this camp, among others. The moderate and strict parties both held their ground while the heretics raged. Pope Benedict comments, quote, the Arian crisis, believed to have been resolved at Nicaea, persisted for decades with complicated events and painful divisions in the church. End quote. And then something happened. 